The Buddha once said that if you could really comprehend food, it would take you all the way to non-return, the third level of awakening. Of course, comprehend here means understanding it to the point of dispassion, where you have no passion, aversion, or delusion around it. So how do, you, how do you go about comprehending food? Well, first there's that reflection we often have about how you eat simply for the sake of maintaining the body so you can practice. It's not for beautification, not for putting on bulk, not for entertainment. And so you try to develop that attitude toward the food. Each time you sit down to eat, ask yourself, how much do you really need? And you have to think about the food in a way that makes eating not such the wonderful thing it always seems to be. The body responds very positively to food. But just think about it. What are we eating? Things that come out of the earth. And even if you're vegetarian, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of labor that goes into getting that food to you. Think of all the farmers who have to work hard under the sun. And it's not guaranteed that the crops will be successful. Then it has to be transported, it has to be stored, it has to be cooked. Then everyone has to clean up afterwards. And then your body has to digest it. Think about the process of digestion. If you were to take the food that you've chewed before you swallowed it and then spit it out, you wouldn't be able to put it in your mouth again. And yet you can swallow it, and then the body works on it. And if you took any of the steps in the process of digestion, again, try to eat it again, you couldn't do it. Yet that's how our body lives. The body needs the food broken down in that way so we can survive, so we can take the nutrients out of it and then get rid of all the excess, all the parts that we can't digest. And that's another whole production there. We build sewer systems, we build sewage tanks, compost toilets, it's a lot of labor. Just so we can keep this body going. Think about Kurt Vonnegut's vision of Mercury, or the little harmoniums, the beings that live on Mercury. All they have to do is tap into the vibration of the crystal that the planet is in his vision. They feed off vibrations. We're not just feeding off of vibrations. We're feeding off of a lot of people suffering. So what are you going to do with that food? What are you going to do with that energy that you get from the food? And when you think about eating a lot of food, how much we could have a really good big meal. You think about that as putting yourself in debt more than you would if you ate just a little bit. So what's the right amount? The right amount is enough to keep the body going. But realizing that you want to get beyond having a body. As a nun, I told that nun that time, we practice so that ultimately we don't have to have food, but we need food in the meantime to learn how to have the right attitude toward it. Because the Buddha is not trying to get you averse to food. There's a contemplation of the foulness of food. That's for people who are just really, really stuck on how great food can be. They've got to have something very strong to counteract that. But if it gets to the point where you're averse to food, that doesn't work either. But you'd have to think about the implications. Because contemplation of food connects with contemplation of the body. This is another big attachment. The problem with the body, of course, is it's either lust or pride, or it's a simple desire that you don't know what you're going to do if you don't have a body. And at the moment of death, when you're evicted, you're going to do anything you can to find another one. This either means hovering around the body. I've told you that story about the woman who 
saw the spirit of the person hanging around the body that was waiting to be cremated. And as John Fung said, there are a lot of those. They're so fixated on the body they can't go on to anything better. You don't want to be in that position. But then what would be better? You get another body and what happens? You're open to all kinds of pains. You have to depend on other people. And this is if you're lucky enough to get a human body. You have to depend on other people. And then what are other people like? As Sartre once said, other people are hell. You try to develop a good relationship with them, and it's totally up to them whether they want to be good to you or not. Other people are totally out of, beyond your control, and yet you're dependent on them. It's not a good position to be. On top of that, once you've got a body, as Sartre Buddha said one time, this body leaves you open to being wounded by sticks and stones and other weapons. It gives you ears which you can hear all kinds of unpleasant things from other people. So it's not an unmitigated good having a body. So you're going to contemplate these things over and over again so that you get a very strong sense that if the time comes to go from this body, you don't want to latch on to another one. Because even divine bodies, they have their drawbacks, and you can't stay forever up in heaven. And if you get used to the pleasures of heaven, it's like those people who live on yachts. Everything gets done for them. But then suddenly they can't live on the yacht anymore, and they get, and they're spoiled. All they can think about is how pleasant it used to be, and now how hard it is now. Well, the Davis is even worse. So you think about this. The whole purpose of this is to decide: I don't want to come back at all. Unfortunately, the alternative is not nothingness. The alternative is total freedom. As the Buddha once said, if you see nirvana as having any negative aspects, that's a wrong view. It's positive all around, positive from every angle. So you have to ask yourself which of your attachments here is really worth it. And the problem with nirvana, of course, is you can't see it. There's always that question, is it really true? As the Buddha himself said, just because it's mentioned in the scriptures doesn't mean it's true. But as he said, leave it open as a possibility. Don't close the possibility. But still, you have to make a lot of sacrifices if you want that. Make that your goal. So this is why it's good to think very strongly about the drawbacks of coming back to having another body, coming back to having eaten human food again. Think about what human food is like in the eyes of the Davis. It's like that story in Once a Future King. There's an owl, Merlin the musician has an owl, Archimedes, who talks and can engage in a very intelligent conversation. But he still eats mice. When the time comes for him to eat, he's very embarrassed that human beings eat their human food, but he has to go back and eat dead mice. I'll have that attitude toward human food compared to food of the Davis. You have to eat it, but it's just there to get by so you can practice, so you can do some good with this body. I'm being very clear-eyed about the, the drawbacks of having a body, and I want you to come back. So when you contemplate food, contemplate the body. It's not to hate these things, it's just to have a strong sense of having had enough. The Buddha uses the word dispassion, disenchantment. Disenchantment is the word that's also used to Talk about when you've had enough of a particular kind of food. You've eaten enough and you've just had enough. You can't 
stomach the idea of having any more. But it's not aversion. It's more sense that you've outgrown it, like you've outgrown your childish habits. You've outgrown your childish games. Because you see, there's nothing of any substance there, nothing of any real value. The food has its value and it keeps the body going. The body has its value and it allows you to practice. So you can get to something better. If you can see it purely as a means to a higher end, then you're heading in the right direction. <laughs>